everyone. So for this week's tutorial, we have two questions. It really talks about how we derive transfer functions from the process by understanding the process and then do the mass balance and derive the transformation for the rearrange and get the final transfer function. And then use this transfer function to understand the process. Okay, so let's first look at the example question six. So for the diagram for the flow sheet shown here, it looks very familiar to the one they, they have in the lecture. But pay attention to the details. Is this the same one or is it a little bit different? The task is to write the transfer function between V1 and V3. So here we use V1 and V3 to indicate the volume flow rate. You can use Q1, Q3 as well. It doesn't matter what symbols you use, but we want them to indicate the relationship between those volume flow rates. Okay? And also, so V1 is in to the first tank. V3 is the final out. And also between V1 and H2, so V1 is still the in light flow, and H2 the level of the second tank. All right, so let's have a think about what is a transfer function between these terms. So for this week, I uploaded the solution to you beforehand. You can have a loop, but pay attention that sometimes I put some tricks there in a solution sheet. So you still need to think about if everything is correct or why I can get this solution there. Okay. So remember this diagram, and let's move to the answer to the first question. So when we get this, okay, good. We just have one homogeneous fluid, this water or any liquid. So we don't have a, well, we just need a mass balance for the overall flow. So it's easier to write because we just know if we put the volume, balance is dV over dT to be the volume change of the system equals the in, volume flow in minus volume flow out. Right? So in this case, because we know this is area of A1 is area of A2, so for first tank, H1 is a level, the V term just equals A1 multiplied by H1. Because A1 is constant, so it's the same, it can be written as A1 multiplied by dH1 over dP. And because V1 is an in, in light flow, volume flow, so write it here. And for V2, it's, it's what we use in the lecture, because here we have a valve of in between of two tanks. And we assume these valves are normally in, in, in these models, so we assume they're, be, they're linearly dependent to the level difference or to the level driving valves. So it's linear resistance. What does it mean? So it just means the, the flow after the valve is normally, either V or Q, normally linear with this coefficient R, 1 over R, because R is the resistance. So you use the the level difference, this can be linking from H1 to H2, so it's level difference H1 minus H2. Use this dot H dividing the resistance R. So this is a linear relationship to describe the valve, how the valve works. The volume flow is linearly dependent to the difference of the, of the level of the height. Okay. So using that, we are able to write the V2 term just as H1 minus H2 dividing R. R is the bulk resistance here. Okay, so for the first one, it's the same. Just like in class, we learn two tanks connecting each other to be interacting or non-interacting process. So it's the same as the first equation. And then we want to get the best balance for the second tank. It seems the same, right? We just write the dynamic of the volume change A2, dH2 over dT equals the inflow. So it's for the second time, the inflow is V2 and outflow is V3 here. 
and they have two and the three. Because we show V2 is already linearly dependent to the level difference. And for the V3, is it is the same to use the, the vowel controller. So this is the first question here. In the class, if you recall the example, we have the second vowel here, and then the V3 is written as a relationship to an R as well. But in this case, if I write this three here, and after a path, we got the outflow V3. Then this V3 is no longer dependent on the vowel or on the height position. It becomes a constant term after the path because the flow rate is controlled by the path already. Imagine in the real world, why do we need a path? We need to add the pressure to the flow, to the flowing liquid, and then this control the volume. So this V3 after the path is already a constant. We have out, outflow there. It's dependent on the path position. So in this case, V3, we just write it here as it itself, dependent on the path position. Right, so this is the basic mass balance. Note the difference from what we have in the lecture notes. Next step is then we got time domain, we transfer it to the Laplace domain to get the transfer function in the S domain. Right, so in the S domain, when we do a transformation, when we have the first order derivative, it's always an important step to define the new deviation variables because we know that for E F over D P equals S F minus F zero, right? It's a general format. We want to cancel this term, so we always define a new deviation variables. That's how although it, they didn't write in that way, but it's suggested you just write in the deviation form. You have your new H one prime here. So we got S before so S H one prime. And this becomes a one prime. H one prime minus H two prime. This is constant R. So for example, your V one prime equals extra V minus V one R, which is the initial steady state constant value. Okay? So this is transform. And for the second one, similarly, we have A2 copied here. And this first order derivative becomes SH2 prime, the same transfer for H1 prime minus H2 prime divided by R. And uh, here is what we need to pay attention. I write it as a V3 here, just copy this V from time domain to Laplace domain. But if I define the new V3 prime, the new deviation variable for the outflow, and what's the definition of this? It is just a real outflow V3 minus the initial V3 bar. But remember, we just discussed, because of this R, this V3's outflow is always at a constant level. That's good. That's how this term is always zero. OK, so that's another nice feature why we use a deviation variable. So for certain terms that does not change with time, it's constant. If we use deviation variable, this whole thing just becomes zero. Alright, so that's very good. We can then use these two equations to further do the analysis. Because we know that our goal is to find the transfer function between V1 and V3 and between V1 and H2. So it's basically like us to have the final form of what is V3 over V1, what is H2 over V1. So this transfer function, either using deviation form, deviation variable, or the original thing, the transfer function will be the same. Okay, so we know that the V3 is always a constant and the V3 prime is always zero. So this term actually, we can know directly it is zero. So 
because this three prime is always zero. So our goal is now is just to get the term for H2 over V1. Okay, so from the initial two equations, we know that we have H1, V1, and H2, but we have two equations. We can then just cancel the H1 term in both equations, and then we are able to get the relationship between H2 and V1. So we have two equations and three variables. If we want to get the correlation between two, we just substitute one H1 from the, the second equation. So this is basic mathematical operation. You can do the calculation yourself. But just be careful about the mathematical operation. It's nothing difficult, but you need to write down or copy all the terms correctly. Although we write all of these here, but we, we discuss this term is actually zero. So you can delete that from the beginning to reduce a lot of computing efforts already. So you don't have to worry about this term. Then you get the second equation. You write the H1 term. You can either decide H1 from the first equation and substitute into second. I'll do a reverse way. But here, just write down the basic procedure. You have your second equation right in here, and you have your first equation by solving what H, H1s. Just use the right-hand side, dividing the left-hand side coefficient, E1rs plus 1, so we got these two terms. And this term, this term is 0. Okay, so we got the H2 and the V1. We can group all the coefficients of H2 on one hand side and uh, V1 on um, the other hand side. So this is intermediate calculation. You can play in all different ways. But eventually, we want to get this format to have H2 with its coefficient and V1 with the coefficient. Then this is closer to the final transfer function because it's just a relationship of H2 over V1. So we rewrite this equation, just divide this to the to the numerator. And why do we need this to group those coefficients? So this just to rearrange it, to reform it, because normally in the Eisenhower function, we want to write in the polynomial format or in those several factors, several terms multiplying together. Therefore, we are able to see what is the holds what are the zeros of the system as we discussed today. So we can group the coefficient and then write them, write them in this kind of format. So this is the final format for transfer function because with this format you can tell what the poles and tell the dynamic features of the system. You can also transfer this back to the time domain using the existing table. But this is not a unique form. You may also get some other, you can group the coefficient and then find a new coefficient. It's a way for creative to write your transfer function, but the basic basic format is just, it's consistent. All right? So this is H2 over V1. As we discussed, for this transfer function, because V3 is always zero, so this transfer function is directly zero don't have to worry about the dynamics of B3. <coughs> okay, so good. With the symbols, we are able to derive the transfer function. And second question asks us, if we are giving the numeric values, can we evaluate what are the final format corresponding to this set of parameters? So this gives us a sense how we really link the transfer function to a physical meaning of the system. Okay, so we are giving that some numeric value of parameters. So if the tanks are vertical cylinders of 0.5 meter in diameter, so we know that diameter is 0.5 and is cylinder format. So the whole area for both tanks is the same. If we know that is pi r square, our one quarter of pi 
B squared, so we know that delta is 0.5, so we're able to calculate the whole area is 0.2 square meter. Okay, so this is area A. And similarly, here it shows the next, about the volume. If we have a flow of 0.12 cubic meter per minute, and we have the liquid levels for steady state operation to be two meter in the first step with each one to be two, and 1.2 meter in the second step, which is H2. So recall that we, we have our, we, our volume flow rate equals to delta H divided R. So using this delta H and the V value, we are able to calculate what is the resistance for this valve, for this R. So just use H1 minus H2 dividing V2 at the given point. So it's 2 minus 1.2 divided by 0.12. Okay, so we got the resistance coefficient. Note that because the unit for this numerator is a level, the height of meter, and the volume flow rate is cubic meter per minute. So all the parameters actually have their own values unless they are dimensionless. So this is minute per square meter to be our value of R. Right? That's how we got the sense. That's why we, we have this term. If we multiply R with A, because A is square meter, so you multiply this two, RA it actually has a unit of time, right? It's because it's minutes. So this can be the time constant. That's how this nice format actually exactly is what we have, like the tau s plus plus one. And so it also, also proves our, our check our results are make sense. Okay. And because it's just two area divided by each other, so it's one, the same area, plus one is two, and our a is 1.34. We got this term before the s to be our tau, the time constant, plus one multiplied by the s term and the two areas sum together as 0.4. All right, so it's good. We got the calculation of the final results. So this this meets our common the, the format we are familiar with with some k over s tau s plus one. Like the general standard format of either first order or second order system. So this is our goal. When we derive the transfer function, we want to finally reach this kind of format to show what is the time constant, what is the poles of the system. Right? Is clear? So this is the first question. We got to the important part of the transfer function. And the first second one is also the similar system, also a tank, a storage tank. But this one has a different function. It's not just one or two connected tanks. It's a tank shown in the figure equipped with a side glass to provide a visual indication of liquid level. So this is commonly used in industry. When you have a huge tank, you normally cannot directly see how, how high, how what's the water level within the tank. You can use a side, we call it a side glass, so it's transparent side glass. Besides it, which is linked to the tank through this R valve here, so it's R2 valve. And then you can use this side glass with, because it's with scale, so you're able to use this to tell what's the level in my side glass. And from this level controller, you are able to indicate what's the real level in my full storage tank. So this is a very good technique. We just very simply translate the level to, to some set glass. Okay? So for this kind of system, we need to have the level control system. So therefore we have the level transmitter connected to either the tank or the set glass. So you can control you can control either the the tank system or the set glass system. And the set glass is 
consider normally because the tank level measurement is quite noisy due to turbulence. So this is a conclusion. This is how in real world we just measure the the set glass because if you measure the the light the tank, it's just a huge tank and there's a lot of disturbance there. Okay? So it may splash the liquids inside, for example. So therefore, to determine how transmitter location is influenced by the process dynamics, we have the following task to do. So first of all, it's transfer function. Here it shows why we need transfer function, because we want to know how our outputs are impacted by the inputs and the input disturbance. So first task is to derive the transfer function of H1 over QI. So again, what is HI? HI is a level in my original tank system, in my storage main tank, and QI is the inlight flow. I'll get the transfer function, and we can assume that both valve and piping between the tank and the side glass act as linear resistance, with values R1 and R2, respectively. the figure, it means that here we have the outflow of piping system and it's R1 as a valve and then we have the flow to the set glass with the R2 to be the valve constant. So if this is the constant resistance, just means again, here we use Q to indicate the volume flow is equals to just the, the level difference or the level dividing this constant. Okay, so this is how we got the linear ball characteristics. We just use this to show our ball characteristics. All right, so we want to get the transfer function first for H1 over QI. And secondly, sorry, this should be B, we want to derive the transfer function of H2 over QI. So H2 is the level in our set glass. We also want to get the relationship from H2 to the inflow QI. Okay, we can think about how to derive this, but it's very similar to the first question. We still start from the mass balance. We are familiar with the process already. Okay, so for mass balance, we can do for both the tank and the set glass. For the tank, it's the same as dv1 over dt equals the inflow. It's just from outside. But here we have another term of outflow because we have two terms of outflow. So one is the linked to the flowing to the pipe system. So it's related to only the H1 because it's from the tank to the, to the surrounding piping. So just using H1 dividing R1, sorry, it's really R1, because it's corresponding to R1 here to Q1. And second term is the Q2, so it's relevant to the height difference, level difference, dividing R2 for the second ball. Okay, so this is the overall mass balance for the main tank. And for the set glass, it's even easier because the dynamic is still the same in A2 over DT. But this outflow from the main tank becomes the inflow to the set glass. So this is only one in term, H1 minus H2 by R2. But we have no outflow because it's just a only accept inflow from the main tank. Okay, so we got the second equation here. Then similar step. Remember we, we do the Laplace transform, so we didn't show a detailed process here, but it's you, how you do the transform for the first order derivative, and then you define your deviation variables. It's always important to define the deviation variables, h prime, so those are all the prime term, and do the rearrangement. So here we already write the noise format for you. But when you do the calculation, you should, you should be careful what do it step by step to get all the 
H and Q terms and group the similar coefficient together. So it's not how we define this variable and then put them in. It's by transforming and rearranging you got the final format. And then based on that format, you define what is your time and the k, the constant. So you can check the results yourself, how you do this transform and define this new time constant, this k constant, and then use this new coefficient to define the two equations. Okay, so this looks good format, but then we can further derive our transfer function. Because we, they say for transfer function, they want to get the relation between H1 and QI first. So we have this equation H1, QI, H2. We just substitute H2 term and uh, use the H1 and QI relationship directly. So you write the group of all the terms of H1 and all the terms of QI, and then we are able to get this direct coefficient on the numerator to numerator form. Okay. So with this, I, because I still have the constant here, as we say for the transfer function, we want to either group all those terms together, so we are able to say what's a what's a final format, or because the, now it's just a coefficient term, it's difficult to to write the expansion fraction to evaluate the coefficient, but you can just use a polynomial term. Just write this as a s squared as then you know the outer of the system and to group the coefficient together. Okay, so here we see that we, besides this coefficient, we also have this tau two s plus one in the numerator. What does this mean? This this reminds us of what we discussed earlier in the class. If we have this denominator as our poles calculated, then we have the numerator to show us what are the zeros of the system, right? So this, this really gave us some zeros of the system and bring quite a lot of dynamic features to show the correlation. So keep this in mind. We have the H1 to QI transfer function in this format. And next step, similar, we want to get H2, so H2 to QI. Because we, we know H2 and H1 has this relationship, it's easier, we got H1 transfer function. We can just directly use this transfer function and then derive, substitute H1 to H2 using equation four. Okay, just take this into the transfer function and then we got this format. Because tau two S plus one, we write eight, here, it cancelled with the right hand side. So tau 2 s plus 1 h2, put this term here, then this very nice cancelled with the term on the numerator. Therefore, we'll get your transfer function for the h2 over qi. It's, it's simplified, it, you don't have this additional term on the numerator, but the numerator, denominator is still the same. Okay, so it's purely derived from the mass balance to this step. Good, we got the second transfer function checked. And then the next question based are based on these transfer functions. Can we further understand what, what do this mean? It asks that provide a physical interpretation for the two limiting k's when R2 has to be zero it's closer to zero, and R2 goes to infinity. So this is like a two extreme case. Recall what R2 means for the vow constant, right? So we have R to be a resistance term, that's why it's on the denominator. So when the resistance is very small, so when your denominator is almost zero, it just means there, there, if you have two tank, this is our main tank, and this is my set glass tank, and my R in between. When this R goes to almost zero, this resistance can be neglected because the flow can be 
quite large, quite smoothly flowing. So there is no resistance between the tank and the, the side glass. So these two are connected together, and the height will be the same. So it can be regarded actually just as a single tank with the area of the two, because they are fully connected with the same height. So it can be regarded as the same because this H difference has, has no heat difference. And as comparison, when, when the R2 goes to infinity, which is this huge resistance in between, you almost cut off the, the connection. Okay? So this term actually becomes almost zero. The flow becomes almost zero because the resistance is too huge. So there's actually no flow into that. So the H2 will be equal to H2 as the initial state. Therefore, if you define your new H2 derived, this is always zero because H2 does not change its time. If it starts with zero, it's always zero. But the deviation term, the difference is always zero compared with its initial state. So H1, actually, because you cut this connection, so H1 will just become an ordinary fourth order response because it's just inflow, outflow. It's like a very normal mass system as we discussed before. It just become a fourth order flowing tank with the area of A1. Okay, so you, you, it's no longer connected with H2. So these are the two extreme points for to show us what that is R, what that is resistance term mean. But what's the, what's the goal of doing this analysis? The final goal is to help us to make the decision how to design the system. Okay? So we want to ask the question, which level connection would be preferred? Since we know the dynamics of H1 and H2 already. So when we want to measure the level, if we want to do the level transmitter, Shall I just measure the original tank, or, I, or I, I, I better just go to the set glass? Okay, so we need to justify our answer to say which dynamic, which level connection are we using, considering the dynamic features of the system. Okay, so they show you these two transfer functions for recall for H1 over QI and H2 over QI. We know that for this loop term, their only difference is that this how to s plus one term on the numerator. Right? So these these are the two transfer functions, and we show that this additional term. So it adds the zero. Adds the when we do the analysis, it adds the zero to a system. So if you recall how we analyze how the zero can harm the system dynamics to be different, this additional term actually adds another different, another side of the dynamic response to a system. So if we assume we have disturbance in the inflow, so if you have inflow is QI, so if you have some disturbance in the inflow, some variation, then this first tank reaction will amplify this disturbance, will this variation in the inflow because it's additional term in the numerator. And this one is good, just a constant, you can regard it as a new K, it's just a constant term. So this one, we recall, it has all different kind of dynamic features. So actually it's not the derivative, we don't have to say it's derivative, it's really the deviation term of Q, I, to I. But if we have these uncertainties of Q, QI, of the inline flow, this noise, this uncertainties in the QI will be amplified by the level controller of, of original H1. That is better to measure the new side glass H2, because it's just a constant term in the numerator. Okay, so we prefer to use a set glass level transmitter. Okay, so this is what we use a transfer function to indicate some system dynamics. So transfer function is just a 
format to show how the output is related to this input. But because we define a lot of rules based on the transfer function, different zero poles, and I think this is a dynamics to the transfer, fun transfer function format. So we are able to get the final transfer function and analyze the system. That's why we need the estimate to analyze the dynamics. 